Hey y'all, welcome to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Donica. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about all the books I read in April. I'm laughing because I feel like my wrap-ups are just getting pushed further and further down the month. And now we're like in June and it's like, oh, oh my gosh. So is life having a YouTube channel. I don't know how people do it. How do you find the time? Honestly, it's because any free time I have, I'm reading. One day my existence on YouTube will just fade off completely and I'm fine. I promise you, I'm, I'm alive and well. It's just, I'm just reading. That's it. That's all I do. Here I am talking about my April reads. Let's get into it. So the first one I read was called Death at the Party by Amy Stewart. I would describe this one as a more slow burn mystery that is set mostly in one house, one neighborhood. I'm usually not one for a neighborhood drama because I feel like sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I feel like the drama involves women being catty with each other. That's not really my cup of tea. So I will tell y'all at the end of the summary what I actually liked about this one. The book opens with our main character Nadine and she is in her basement um, watching a man die. We learn that it is midnight and Nadine is hosting a party for her mother. There's around 100 guests currently out in her yard. So while the party is still raging we are now left wondering who is this man and why is Nadine watching him die. Then we flash back to the morning and this is very centered around Nadine's family and Nadine so there's not a ton of characters like I said the setting is very localized to her home or the neighborhood but she's just preparing for the evening. Nadine a character after my own heart loves her lists hands them out to the entire family this is what you gotta do and you gotta do please get it done I will get anxious if you don't do what's on this list. So a lot of the book is party prep, trying to get things in order while Nadine faces other crises in her life, personal or otherwise, but all of this is happening for Nadine's mother. We learned that Nadine's mother is a very famous author and a very successful author. Her mother has actually not celebrated a birthday party for almost three decades, and that's because 30 years ago, the last time her mother was having a birthday, Nadine's aunt, her mother's sister, was found deceased in a barn. Since that traumatic moment, Nadine's mother has just done away with parties because not only is it an anniversary of her birth, it's also the anniversary of her sister's death. So as the party is drawing closer, secrets are revealed, the past and the present are colliding. In the beginning, we did see that there is a man that is deceased in her basement. And as the book gets going, what I really liked is there are multiple options of, of who could this man be? It's not just going to be, oh, this is the clear, maybe, maybe, you can call it but for me I couldn't quite say who that man would be obviously as we get closer to the ending it becomes a little more clear a little more obvious but there are definitely multiple options of who it could be and why Nadine might want them to die so for the pros of this book I enjoyed Nadine's character I enjoyed that while she was anxious and maybe prone to become overwhelmed I didn't see it as a weakness it's kind of was just like a part of her character it wasn't being used as a crutch or an excuse for her to be a like demure weak character no it was just like yeah she has anxiety this is how she deals with it which same sister I thought that although it was slower paced I think this did something that another one of my books this month I'll talk about did really well and that is it gives you little reveals maybe nothing mind-blowing little small reveals about the plot or the characters and I thought it did it really well kept me gripped kept me entertained the drama in here I liked it because it wasn't women fighting with other women. It wasn't like these catty fights. The drama in here was really Nadine. You'll find out early on one of the plot points and why that factors into the stress Nadine's feeling and things like that. So I did like that. It was kind of mistakes that Nadine has made that's causing the drama and not really just some random neighbor that's jealous of her. And actually it's quite the opposite. I didn't even say, but I gave this three and a half stars. Quick read, easy read if you enjoy a little bit of a slow burn mystery. The only thing I would say about the writing is that sometimes Nadine would, like her mind would wander into the past, some type of story that relates to what's happening. And then at the end of that moment, which would be a couple of pages, kind of of a little tangent, she would be like, anyway, <laughs> that's how that flashback would end. It didn't feel like a super smooth transition from flashback to 
present. But who am I to judge? Like honestly, the anyway is a good enough transition for my channel. So who am I to judge? Anyway, next book. <laughs> I ended up reading two stories under 200 pages and they were both horror. So the first one was called Sour Candy by Keelan Patrick Burke. And this one's only 84 pages. In Sour Candy, this is a cosmic horror novella. And I gave this one four stars. For being 84 pages, I feel like it gave me what it was supposed to give and it had a satisfying ending. I'm always so shocked when an author can really give you like a full story beginning, middle, and end in such a short amount of pages. Let me tell y'all how this novella starts. It says, four months to the day he first encountered the boy at Walmart, the last of Phil Pendleton's teeth fell out. Who else loves sour candy? I grew up with sour candy. You know, in South Texas, we are big lovers of Mexican candy. So Chamoy, Lucas, my mouth's going water. I love it. And we put that stuff on everything. But my, my all time favorite was warheads. I swear to y'all that my tongue is like desensitized a little bit because of how many warheads I ate. I feel like the years spent eating warheads <laughs> took off the top layer of my tongue. I swear to y'all. We find our main character, Phil. He's just enjoying a normal Saturday. His girlfriend was craving chocolate. So he ran to Walmart for her. In the candy aisle, he sees a woman kind of just staring at this candy, almost in like a trance, which maybe not too odd, but beside her, her, her son, who is just a small child, maybe four or five, is screaming at the top of his lungs. So although this is odd, there's really not much Phil can do. A manager is coming to talk to the woman. While well, he's driving home, he is rear-ended. So he gets out, he's a little dazed, a little confused, goes to sit down on the curb while the police come. He realizes that the person that rear-ended him is that woman from Walmart. So he tells the police officer she has a child with her. So as the police officer runs to go make sure that the child is safe, the woman walks over to him, only tells him two words yours now. Just imagine how creepy that would be someone coming up to you and just being like, yours now. Unless it's a puppy, ma'am, carry on. Following the accident, Phil's life changes drastically as he is now seemingly the parent to that little child that was screaming at Walmart. There's a lot of questions I'm sure you're asking, like how is this possible? Well, remember, this is Cosmic Horror, so it's a little, it gets a little crazy sometimes. He really can't convince anyone that he's not this little boy's father. And if that is your nightmare, that a small child is now suddenly in your care and no one believes you that you are not their parent, well, it only gets worse from there, guys. This child is very needy, only likes candy, and let's just say there are some relation to an eldritch lord. This is a really great novella. If you like cosmic horror, I think you'll enjoy this. And if you've been wanting to read a cosmic horror but are not quite sure where to start, this would be a good place, I think. It gives you a little bit of everything. So the next short story I read was We Need to Do Something by Max Booth III. Max Booth actually has a bookstore in San Antonio called Ghoulish and it only sells horror books. I can't quite remember how I read this book. It was an ebook of some kind. I'm not sure if I checked it out. I do remember that I listened to it as an audiobook as well as reading along with it and the narrator was excellent. So I did give this book around three stars. As the book opens, we meet our family of four. They are all receiving tornado warnings, so they are headed into their bathroom. This family includes a mom, a dad, a sister, and a brother. The only name I remember out of that whole family is the little brother. His name is Bobby. The only reason this book did not get probably a higher rating is because Bobby's character is so annoying. When you establish a character as, look, there's this character named Bobby. He's really annoying. He's gonna make a lot of poop jokes, a lot of fart jokes. It's like, okay, establish that character and then we don't have to do that throughout the whole 188 pages. Like we get it. It was so cringy reading it and then the poor narrator having to read it. But yes, my main issue was definitely little Bobby. So as they're in the bathroom taking shelter, the tornado hits and a tree crashes into their house and effectively cuts them off from everything because it crashes into the door and they cannot open it. They're now stuck in this bathroom no food. If I get a tornado warning, I probably would not be thinking about bringing in like a granola bar. Now I'm like thinking I should have a emergency pack of food just in case, but they have no food. So as you can imagine, things start going downhill quickly, especially because the father is a complete D-bag. He's an alcoholic. He comes in with just a small amount of alcohol. So as time progresses and he's without alcohol, things are getting really hard for him and dark 
for the family. This entire story takes place in the bathroom. We don't get any scene changes. Not long after they enter the restroom, all of their phones die. So their concept of time is really skewed. As the book goes on, things do get a little distorted and weird. But I kind of enjoyed that, them not knowing what time it is. We don't know how long they've been in there. It feels like days and days, but they're wondering how can that be? They have neighbors. They're not in some secluded forest. They should have neighbors that have seen that this tree has crashed into their house. So why is no one coming to help them? And even a little bit more scary, why can't they hear anything from outside? This is one of those books where I think we do get a little bit of an explanation. Like we do get what could be happening. I would not say that this is an ending that is wrapped up for us. So if you don't like your endings like that, just kind of be wary of that. But if you like books that go off the rails a little bit, I think you will enjoy this. But I'm definitely going to read more from him and definitely going to go to that bookstore and he sells his own books. So I'll probably pick up a couple from his bookstore. So it's super cool and I'm super excited for that. Okay, next up, I did a book talk on this. So I'm not going to go too in detail about it, but it is The Only Survivors by Megan Miranda. I don't know what it is about her, but I want to love her so bad. Like I really me do. I just think it's because I like her plots. I feel like the stories that she's trying to tell are interesting to me. So I read The Last to Vanish and The Girl from Widow Hills. So I've read two of her books. At, well, and this will be the third. This one, I think in my book talk, I gave it a three and a half star. Mm, I think I'm gonna round it down. You know, now that I've spent a little time on it, I think I'm going to give it three stars. This novel follows a group of characters who 10 years ago, they were on the brink of graduating high school. They were heading back from a school trip when tragedy struck. Both of the buses carrying students and two teachers careened into a ravine and only nine students survived. In present day, when we find them, even less of those nine remain, but the seven survivors left have all agreed that every year on the anniversary of the crash, they will meet at a beach house on the Outer Banks. Our main character, Cassidy, who we're following, is absolutely over it. She does not want to be a part of this tradition anymore. She just doesn't think it benefits her, and she's not even planning to go this year. But after learning some devastating news, she's sucked back in and makes her way there to the Outer Banks. As soon as she gets there, she just feels like the vibes are off. The vibes of this group are never immaculate, but definitely this year they're even more off than usual. So when one of them goes missing, Cassidy starts questioning how well she knows these people. It definitely feels like this group is linked through trauma, not friendship. So that definitely kind of aids in this feeling of unease. How well do I know this person? It's been 10 years. How much do I owe these people? It's been 10 years. They're not really my friends. How much do you really owe people that are linked to you by trauma? And especially especially if it doesn't benefit you. So along with present day, we're also getting flashbacks to the past. And these were my favorite part. These flashbacks are after every chapter and we're following the perspective of every character that survived the night of the bus crash. After reading this, I kind of got the urge to watch Yellow Jackets, which is a Showtime original TV show. The first season came out a couple of years ago, but I know it's been getting more and more buzz because the second season just released. So I knew that one involved a group of friends being stranded or a group of, it was a high school soccer team. They were headed to nationals, I wanna say, and their plane crash. So this book made me want to watch that series and holy cow okay the first season incredible the second season no questions answered only more questions i don't know how i feel about the second season but i marathoned the first and second season with my husband <laughs> we both liked it so much even though there are so many questions left unanswered we were like okay we're hooked <laughs> After watching Yellow Jackets, I was like, man, that Megan Miranda book really did not do enough with the plot. Like I kind of thought, man, present day, there's not too much going on. And the ending when everything's revealed, it was a little lackluster to me. And then the flashbacks were so short. I really wish that she would have spent more time on the flashbacks and the survival because there really wasn't much of that. So like I said, I really want to love her stories, but I feel like she is missing that something special, that pizzazz in her books that will just take it over the top to be a book that I really really love. I think another thing is her characters. I didn't feel connected to any character in this book. Like I mentioned there's seven of them. We get little bits and pieces of them but 
there wasn't enough to make me feel connected to them, to make me worry about what could be happening to them. The character that goes missing, she's there for one or two chapters. So when she goes missing, yes, it's mysterious, but why should I be invested in that character? But the good thing is this book made me go watch Yellow Jackets, which I enjoyed. So that's awesome. I love exploring the idea of a group of people having to fight for their life because when it's you versus them, loyalties go out the window really quick. So the next book I read was A House with Good Bones by T. Kingfisher. I gave this book three and a half stars. The first book I ever read by T. Kingfisher was The Twisted Ones. If you haven't read her before, her characters always have a little bit of humor, dark humor or dry humor. And so after not liking The Twisted Ones that much, I think it's just because I didn't know what to expect. And you know, that was kind of on me. Then last year I read What Moves the Dead, which was an Edgar Allan Poe retelling. And I just absolutely love that one. And I actually saw that a sequel is coming. I'm like, what the? Yes, I don't know how, I don't know why, but I'm here for it. So this one kind of reminded me a little bit of the Twisted Ones in the way that there's something really unique and strange going on and kind of the reveal, just not what I was expecting at all. Definitely a unique take on gothic horror, like a creepy house, what's going on. The genre of this book is horror, but honestly y'all, I feel like it was a mystery for 80% of the book. <laughs> there are a couple of creepy things that happen, but for a lot of the book, we're dealing with our main, main character whose name is Sam and Sam's mom's been acting weird. And Sam's trying to figure out what's going on with her mom. And a lot of the book is just that, her exploring her house and going into her attic and trying to get to the bottom of why is her mom being weird? So Sam is actually a archeo entomologist, which is someone that studies insects that are found in archeological remains. This is where the book shined for me. Her love for bugs and her knowledge of bugs was included in the plot and she would talk about bugs. And it was just, it was so interesting. I love when a character really, really shines. Like she's a unique character and it's not just like, I love bugs, the end. No, T. Kingfisher included that throughout the book and you got a good sense of who Sam was. And it helped that Sam had that same lighthearted, dry humor that just works so well. I loved Sam so much. Sam is moving with her mom for a few months because she was supposed to go to a job site. So she canceled her lease, moved out of her apartment, but the funds dried up or something like that happened. So she was kind of left without a home. So she calls her mom, hey, can I move in with you for a couple of months? It won't be that long. As Sam gets to her mom's house, she quickly realizes that something just feels off with her mom's behavior. And not only that, but when she walks into the house, a house that was once fun and had unique art on the walls, was painted a bunch of cool colors, really showing her mom's personality, has now been sterilized. Everything has been removed, everything has been painted white, and her mother just seems more anxious. And in fact, her mother, right when she gets there, says, I'm so glad to see you. I wish it wasn't here. Sam is like, here at this house? Like, what are you talking about? It just seems like her mom is afraid, but of what or who? I can't remember what happens to Sam's father, but it's just her mom living there. So Sam is very concerned about what could be going on to make her mom be acting like this. I want to say something also like dementia runs in the family. So Sam initially is worried that that's what's happening with her mom. So as Sam digs into her mom's life, she's trying to figure out what exactly could be happening. This leads her to a neighbor who was very unliked by Sam's grandmother, who has been deceased for many years. Her grandmother hated this neighbor, so Sam never really interacted with her. But her grandmother was an evil, evil woman. Sam has always been on the bigger side. Her grandmother would call her a little piggy when she was little. So the grandmother was a horrible person. So now that she's deceased, Sam is looking to the neighbor for help, especially because she knows that the neighbor is friends with her mom. So she wants to know, have you noticed any changes? And this neighbor has a vulture, a pet vulture who is adorable, was not on my 2023 reading bingo card, but here we are. <laughs> just an adorable character for the story. So if you look at the cover, that's just one area where the vulture comes into play. So Sam digging into her mother's life, what could be going on, leads Sam into darker parts of her family history and how that could be related to what's going on. So despite the first 75% not really having too much that was like eliciting fear or uneasiness in me, the plus part kind of made up for it. Plot wasn't my absolute favorite, but there were some really cool, unique aspects to it. So these next ones, I'm gonna fly through y'all because I did a whole video where I read extreme horror and I know that's not everyone's cup of tea. So if you are interested, I will link it down below. The first one when I read was 100% match. I know, terrifying. This actually ended up being my absolute favorite. Five stars, 
so disgusting, so disturbing, incredible. In this one, we're following our main character, Bart. He is looking for his perfect match. Bart is using his vast knowledge in statistics to help him find his perfect match. Bart is not just a lonely man. He's a very disturbed man and a very disgusting man. The one thing in this book that I absolutely was so disgusting to me is I have a very adverse reaction to gross things that involve food. This has some really gross stuff concerning food. And you know, it doesn't help that Bart is a freaking fry cook at a restaurant, y'all. Horrible, horrible. This book kind of traumatized me because I have eaten fast food several times since reading this book. I will think about it while I'm eating fast food. I'll be like, oh, that's pleasant. That's, that's great. I was just trying to eat my Big Mac in peace and this book pops up into my mind. It's like, so gross. Next up, I read Heather by Edward Lee. And this one, I gave three stars. This one was written in 1995. And it's kind of one of the OGs of graphic horror, especially for 1995. This was pretty disturbing. And it's still pretty disturbing. Like it holds up. It's very disturbing. In this one, we're following two characters. One is Travis. He has recently been released from prison and he's moving in with his grandpa who tells him that now that he is released and he's a grown man, it's time that he lets him in on on a favorite family pastime and they call it a header. The second character is Special Agent Stuart Cummings. He is a crooked cop who allows drug runners to go through his route unchecked. He allows that for a price because his wife is really sick. The price of her medicine is rising. So working with these drug dealers is a lucrative business for him. These two perspectives began coming together because bodies start piling up in or around the town that Stuart is working in. And although he is a crooked cop, he still feels like not much is being done about all these bodies. So he starts investigating. So Stuart is trying to get to the bottom of it. And we have Travis over here who's making up for lost time. And just FYI, viewer discretion is advised when it comes to this book because a header is very gross. But aside from the the header being a shocking thing to read. That's about all that this book had once you got past what a header is because I'm reading these books, Extreme Horror, to be disturbed. So once I got past reading that, the writing was very basic to me. I didn't enjoy this one that much, but I had to read it. There's no reality where I don't read this because it comes up so much and I had to know what a header is. Am I better for knowing? No, I'm not. <laughs> But, you know, I got that one out of the way. So next up, I read Talia by Daniel J. Volpe. And this one really showed me that extreme horror really serves up some really good endings. Twist endings, unique endings. After reading those first two, I was like, okay, these endings have been giving me what I want. Like, this is awesome. This one just solidified it for me. Like, wow, extreme horror or splatter punk, they know what we want. They really do be giving us some satisfying endings. So so Talia, I gave four stars. This one is really good and this one does have a sequel. So I do plan on reading it in the future. In this book, it's the early 1990s and we're following our main character Talia who is looking to make it big in the big city. So she moves from her little small Midwest town to the Big Apple. She realizes really quickly that hopes and dreams don't pay the bills. In order to survive, make ends meet, she begins starring in underground porn. So at the time, the porn was being filmed on VHS tapes. So as interest grows for these tapes, so do the demands of the clients that are asking for these tapes. Talia is being asked to do more and more depraved things. And by the time she realizes that she wants out, it is too late. The people that Talia is working for, they're not going to let her go that easy. So some of the scenes in here were very reminiscent of like scenes in some of my favorite gory horror movies from like the 2000s. One scene in particular reminded me of a scene out of a hostel movie and I was here for it. I was so here for it and like I said the ending was great. The last book I read for my extreme horror reading week was the one that had the most disturbing graphic scene out of all of them. The book that I'm talking about is The Clown Hunt by Judith Sonnet. So I gave this one four stars. This book kind of like did a reverse uno on us. So instead of a book centered on killer clowns, this book is actually following a group of sadistic murderers who are killing clowns. So our main character who is extremely likable and was one of my favorite characters of all the books, his name is Willow. He just happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, dressed up like a clown, and he is captured along with several other people who were dressed up as clowns. They are led out to a forest and released to be hunted. 
good. There was plenty of gory fun in this book, which is exactly what I was looking for, but there's one scene in particular that just gave me such a reaction where I, my, my eyes were watering. It was almost like I was so hurt by the scene that I knew it was coming too. I had to take a, a moment before I carried on. I was like, no, tell me this isn't gonna happen. It was absolutely brutal. And at the time I was like, I'm not sure if I'm gonna read her again, but I will. So that wrapped up my extreme horror reading week. So I was thinking, let me just have an easy mystery. Let me read something, even if it's not good, at least let it be easy. And I was pleasantly surprised by The Soulmate by Sally Hepworth. This one I gave four stars. Yeah, and this is the one that kind of did what A Death at the Party did, where it did such a good job of giving little reveals. This one probably even did a better job of giving you little reveals throughout that just kept you hooked. It is a character driven novel and we're following two perspectives and two marriages. There is a now and there is an after. So that's kind of how I'll be referring to them. But in present, in now, we're following Pippa. She lives on a cliffside home in a sleepy coastal town. This was her and her husband's dream home. And it wasn't until she purchased the home that they realized that there's a spot right outside her sliding glass back door. There's a spot called The Drop. And this spot is notorious for being a place where people will go to in their lives. So after moving in, Pippa's husband kind of takes it upon himself to save anyone he sees going out there. And he has been successful seven times already until the night that he wasn't. Now let's flash to our second perspective, Amanda, and her perspective is after. Amanda is the woman that he could not save. Since it's after, post her jumping off, Amanda is a ghost. It does work. Like it's done really well in the way that obviously it's mildly unbelievable y'all, right? Like how many times are we going to read the perspective of a ghost? But it does work and I liked it. So through her perspective, we're watching everything unfold. Like I said, the reveals come really well. So she's not going to reveal everything straight away. So in the beginning, she's watching things play out. She sees her husband hearing the news. Also through her perspective, we're getting flashbacks of her marriage with her husband, how it came to be up until the day that she jumped. So we have two perspectives, two marriages. Both are very different. Kind of right away, Peppa feels a little off about Amanda's death. She's kind of questioning what she saw and kind of wondering, could her husband have done something? There's just no way. She knows her husband through and through. She knows her husband could never do something like this and why? He's been successful seven times. Why with this woman would things change? So she brushes off a lot of her feelings, you know, because this is her husband, like this is her soulmate. So with Amanda's perspective, it's adding layers to the mystery, layers to the story. And we realize that Gabe knew Amanda. So we're gonna learn how he knew her and why might he wanna hide that. So very much like Amanda's perspective, Pippa's perspective is gonna have flashbacks of how she met Gabe and their relationship up until present day. You're reading two relationships from basically the start of each one, Pippa's and Amanda's. Both women are doing a lot for love. It's kind of asking the question, what would you do for love? Or a better question, what should you do for love? What should your partner be able to ask from you. I was interested from start to finish. I enjoyed the reveal. I think as we get along and you start getting the full picture, especially with how this book is looking at love and looking at marriages and relationships and all that, I think the ending was perfectly done. But yeah, just expect a kind of slow burn from start to finish. The last book I read in my favorite book of the month and probably gonna be one of my favorite books of the year, History of Fear by Luke Dumas. Look how pretty it is. Oh my gosh, it's my entire aesthetic. <laughs> I love the cover. So I know when I saw reviews of this book, some reviews saying that the writing was pretentious, which that's always a red flag for me. If, if I see pretentious in any review, I'm scared because I hate pretentious writing. I don't really think I care about pretentious characters, it's just the writing. If the writing comes off pretentious, I struggle with it. That definitely gave me a pause when I was picking up this novel, but the premise of this book was so good. I was like, I'm giving you a chance. I'm gonna give you a chance because this sounds incredible. And thank goodness, because it was like five stars. Before I go into the summary, I will tell you that this kind of reminded me, not of the plot, but it reminded me of The Last House on Needless Street by Catriona Ward, which I absolutely love that book. But you will find a lot of people that don't like it. And it's one of those books where I would have to 
spoil the entire plot to tell you what exactly is underneath the plot, what exactly is happening in the book. And that's kind of how this book is, where you may get to the end and be like, wow, I absolutely hated that that was what this was all about. <laughs> but I can't really tell you because that would just ruin the entire book. This is a book within a book. This is a true book within a book and an epistolary novel. It starts with a fictional editor's foreword and the editor's name is Daniela. And she's just explained to us how this book came to be and how she was tasked with turning a manuscript into the book we are now holding in our hands. It all started with a man named Grayson Hale. He was an American living in Scotland and attending the University of Edinburgh. In 2017, he confessed to brutally murdering a fellow student. This was already a sensationalized crime, but it gained further notoriety when Grayson claimed that the devil made him do it. So he was sentenced to life in prison, but 19 months later he was found hanging in his prison cell from apparent suicide. Oddly enough, the guards that found him claimed he had scratches across his entire torso, not from fingernails, but it looked like from a small animal or creature of some kind that had three talons. On the prison desk next to his body, they found a handwritten manuscript called The Memoirs and Confessions of Grayson Hale. So that is what a history of fear is. You know, we're getting bits of his childhood through his memories or what he's writing down, but it's primarily telling us the start of everything. The start of how he went from a student finishing up college to murdering his friend and fellow student Liam. Since this is from Grayson's perspective, we do get bits of his past as he remembers them and as it pertains to the story he's telling. What's so cool about this is at the end of every chapter, Daniela is adding in things that she feels relevant to Grayson's manuscript. So we're getting text messages, we're getting court transcripts of when he was on trial, we're getting interviews that Daniela does with Grayson's family, friends, acquaintances at the time. It was so cool to see if other people's perspectives were able to corroborate what Grayson is telling us in his manuscript or did they see things differently? Because we don't know. All we're getting is what Grayson is telling us as truth. And we don't really know as we're reading, was he going insane? Is he insane? We can take what Grayson is saying in a couple of ways. Was this a first person account of his life as he knows it? Was this a made up story? Is he just trying to clear his name and make us feel bad for him? Or as the book states, is this a warning sent straight from the depths of hell? Which is so spooky. Because let's remember that he's saying the devil made him do it and in his manuscript and as we read we are seeing some very odd things happening. This book is not open-ended per se but I definitely think you could read it from your lens in one way and I could have read it from another and we could both argue our points like what's real? What was not real? I have zero cons for this book. I had zero things there's nothing I did not like about this book and I'm so excited. He has another book coming out in December of this year. That's probably one of my most anticipated reads now for the remainder of the year. In terms of, you know, the pretentious comments I saw, I think I definitely know where people are coming from because Grayson has a lot of trauma. Grayson did not have a good childhood. His dad was an absentee father. His mother and older brother were absolutely horrible people. He kind of used knowledge as this crutch. He thought, if I am this smart, if I am this successful, I will finally be loved. So I think him being a very smart character, because like out of necessity, he thought knowledge would equate love in some way. You know, maybe I will be loved by someone in my life. If he's writing in a certain way, it's simply because of that. So maybe if you're worried a little bit about, you know, I hate pretentious characters or pretentious writing, I would definitely try the audiobook. The audiobook was really good. So maybe start there if you're kind of unsure, because it might be easier for you to hear Grayson's personality through the narrator. Not only was that book super interesting, awesome premise, but also at the very heart of it and what, what's going on in this book once it's revealed, it's so dark, so heartbreaking. If he hits it out of the park with his second book, I am joining his fan club. If he has a fan club, I'm joining it. That one was probably one of the biggest surprises for me this month. Definitely was like not expecting to like it. Definitely not expecting to love it. <laughs> if you have any questions about any of these books, 
y'all my brain is not working at 100 percent ever and ever at any point so if i'm not clear on certain things in a book please feel free to reach out to me and i will answer any questions you may have but as always thank y'all so much for watching y'all take care and i will see you in my next video